Um, hello everybody, I'm Katie Childs and I'm the Chief Executive at Chawton House and thank you so much for joining us um, for our virtual garden festival and for this very special Zoom Q&A um, with the wonderful Kim Wilson who has, I have a prop for the first time in one of these, who's written this really um, beautiful book uh, In the Garden with Jane Austen and we couldn't think of a better um, way of rounding off a, a beautiful weekend of talking about um, Jane Austen and gardens and Shorten House Gardens and all that's associated with it um, um, than having Kim involved in the programme. Um, my colleague Cleo is also here as well. Are you going to give a wave Cleo for you to one of the few other people that you can see? Hello everyone. Um, and so um, Cleo will be keeping an eye on some of the questions with me. Um, now, it is a Q&A, so the best way, um, or the two ways in which you can ask questions um, is there's a chat function on Zoom. So if you type your question into the, into the chat function, then, um, then Cleo and I will keep an eye on it and ask, and ask him that question. Um, but if you would uh, like to ask your question uh, out loud, um, then there's a digital hand that you have on, on Zoom. It's a bit different on every device, but there's a, there's a kind of... Uh, at three dots that says more if you click on that you'll get through to, to raise hand and you raise a little blue hand that appears on mine and Cleo's screen so we'll come to you unmute your microphone because most people are muted but unmute your microphone um, and then we can have a have a lovely conversation um, so whilst everybody's thinking of, uh, of their questions or typing their questions out for, for Kim um, and it's lovely uh, lovely to see you Kim um, I had a, a really lovely read of your um, of your book last night, knowing that we were knowing that we were going to do this. Um, but there are a few things that 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 struck me. It's certainly the variety of gardens that Jane Austen would have been familiar with, and I don't think I'd before thought of those um, those city gardens. Um, so it's it's definitely something where she, you can see them within her novels that she had this huge um, breadth of, of kind of. Uh, in, influence in, in which she weaves into into her works. Was there a garden when you were looking through this that surprised you? Well, I hadn't known about the city gardens either myself, um, and she doesn't talk about that much. I think she was a, a country girl at heart. Um, but yes, I was um, surprised at the changing patterns of planting. Um, you know, the, the landscape fashions and all, but the city gardens, I think, was truly the most surprising. And then to find out how impossible and difficult they were um, to even grow anything uh, with the, the soot. Yeah. So I could see why she wanted to get back out of the city and, and into more of a countryside garden. <laughs> Um, I was really struck with your um, explanation of Mrs. Austen uh, gardening in her kitchen garden in, in an old uh, gown, um, which you're right, that's what we all do when we head out into the garden, is in it's sort of old, an old top and jeans. Uh, to yeah, be able to yes. we're, we're quite hands-on in, in the gardens, particularly, and particularly Mrs. Austen. Yes, and Mr. Collins, of course. I, I've always loved that, that... Charlotte was encouraging him to for the, the healthful exercise to be outside as much as possible. Um, it, uh, you know, a lot of times you would have a servant do your, your, especially the weeding, like a great estate, they often would hire women and children from the village. So I think it's, it's lovely that Mrs. Austin enjoyed it. Um, I think it's probably good for her health. Um, Absolutely. Um, now, question here in the chat from, um, what, well, from Mark? Um, <laughs> And uh, it says, hi Kim, could you talk a little about your background and how you got into this consideration of Jane Austen and her gardens? Oh, okay. Well, I have to confess that I um, always think of myself as a gardening enthusiast, <laughs> as opposed to an expert. Oh, this covers a multitude of sins, including most of my own garden right now. Um, I've always come to it from Jane Austen, um, and I'm usually answering my own questions. Uh, so, for example, you know, the tea book and, and like the recipes I've done in there were because I wondered, uh, I noticed the tea and I wondered uh, what a route cake was. You know, it just sounds so strange. <laughs> um, 
Right. And so I answered my own questions. And in this case, it truly was because of shrubbery. I wondered what a shrubbery was. Um, because I always think of like Monty Python, right? You know, we'd like a nice shrubbery, you know, not too large. And <laughs> so I didn't know. Um, and you just think I have shrubs in my garden. What, what would a shrubbery be? And so I started to investigate it. And then you start to notice. And so truly it was through a love of Austin. Um, and then I started noticing, it really struck me um, how Jane Austen seemed to value these qualities of a garden. And I wanted to explore that in her characters and what it tells us um, about her characters. And I, you know, everyone often says that Austen doesn't spend a lot of time describing people, you know, the characters, their actual physical appearance and dress, all those things we'd love to know all about. Uh, unless it's someone like uh, Mrs. Elton, who, you know, is making too big of her, big a deal of her finery. So she doesn't do that. But if you notice, she does wax lyrical about landscape uh, and the associated emotions. And so it, it drew me closer to her to think about that. And then you know how it is, you begin to realize, oh, well, that must inform that scene, or clearly that's a sign of the character's um, character. And uh, so then I wanted to write about that too. So hmm. keep thinking of my own questions to answer. <laughs> I have a question, um, if, if I might jump in. Um, have you seen the new uh, Olivia Wilde film, um, Emma? Um, the new Emma? No, no, um, it's, it's on my to-do. We've been surprisingly busy considering that we're all stuck in our houses. Um, you, you might like the um, beginning, the opening scene. Um, because Emma, with two of her servants, sort of at night or in the early hours of the morning, goes into a very beautiful and opulent greenhouse and she sort of ah. points at a flower and her servant cuts it for her. And I was just wondering, is that quite a sort of legitimate pursuit for someone of Emma's wealth and status to sort of be flower picking, but in a very um, genteel manner? Oh, yes. And, and in fact, I've often thought that um, Elizabeth in Persuasion, uh, Anne Elliot's sister, she has her favorite plants and, and you know seems to take an interest, which is really one of the better things that we know about her. Uh, and yet you really can't imagine that she's ever had you know garden soil under her fingertips, so uh, under her fingernails, can you? Um, so um, yes, very common. Um, and I believe that that is what Mrs. Austin's niece was making that distinction um, that that Mrs. Austin chose to do that herself was somewhat remarkable. Uh, Mrs. Grant in Mansfield Park, you see it, Austin mentions her as giving directions to the gardener. Um, so often ladies and gentlemen did, you know, they read the gardening manuals, they would form opinions, they would learn about, you know, the best proper scientific way to do something and give directions. Um, but then you had people to do some of the hard work. And, and I often think if I had people, what I could accomplish, you know. <laughs> I, I spend most of my time in my garden, you know, battling ground elder and things. I don't know if you, um, that's a problem for you, but. <laughs> I think we can all sympathize with that one. Um, oh, and can I just parenthetically explain, uh, Mark may have seen this on Twitter, but about the Emma movie, uh, my, um, I put up on my thing, almost a film consultant. Um, Last year, they emailed me and asked if I would consult on set for Emma um, as a tea, you know, to advise the cast members for tea because of tea with Jane Austen. And uh, could I give them a call and we'd discuss it? And so I did. And they said, oh, you're American. And I was like, well, yes, but I come over, you know, and, and, uh, and, and we talked it over for a while. I said I could combine it with a research trip. And, and they said, well, you know, we won't trouble you. We want someone who can just pop in. <laughs> and you know, as necessary. And uh, but my daughter said, "Oh, mom, you should have just moved to England, you know, for four months." <laughs> so, so yes, oh. I'm almost a film consultant. <laughs> I look forward to seeing hmm. um, I had a, um, uh, another question from Mark here, which is: Any tips on a classic Jane Austen flower? Oh. Well, okay. this is a question, Kim, we've been asked throughout the, the festival. Um, yes. So kind of, what are the classic yeah. flowers? There's one that intrigues me. I don't know if I would call it a tip, but um, 
Mignonette is referred to um, often in her letters. She's writing back and forth with Cassandra and talking about various the slips of plants and the the seeds that the family got. And they and Edward's estate at Garmersham supplied them with with their seeds, and and then the Austins would pass them out. So Miss Ben in Chawton uh, Village was given. Um, here's my daughter. Hey. <laughs> Um, was given seeds from Garmersham, and they were discussing at one point, they were trying to grow mignonette, um, which is a plant, it's Reseda odorata, and that's a plant that is um, a flower that's intrigued me, and I haven't tried to grow it here yet, so I don't know if I would call that a tip, but I think we should all try to grow mignonette and see whether we have better luck than the Austins did. Um, <laughs> and apparently it wasn't very pretty, but it was grown for its scent, uh, very commonly in cities, um, visitors to London remarked on how the window boxes, so there's for you, Mark, in your window box, um, that it was grown very commonly, um, probably to mask the scent of the cities. Um, so it's highly fragrant, not a very spectacular bloom, um, but the Austins had problems getting it to come up. So that's, that's what I'm going to try next. So is that our challenge then? Is to uh, we'll see. see who can see who can grow it. Yeah, yeah. Let's have the mignonette challenge. That would be good. <laughs> I will. I quite, I quite like that as a lockdown gardening challenge. Let's see. <laughs> Let's yeah. see do you do you grow it at at Charton House? Do you know? I don't think we do. Um, no, I don't think we do. But um, that's not to say that we can't try in the future. Okay. Um, well, uh, the question I was. Um, Oh, sorry, go ahead, Cleo. I just remembered in our last Zoom on sort of um, pressed flowers, etc. cetera, um, someone asked a question, but we said it might be a better one for, for you, Kim. Um, we know Mrs. Norris, who isn't a very nice character, is sort of known for pressing flowers, which um, doesn't say much for the pursuit. So um, the question was, are there any other characters that you know of in Jane Austen's novels who also like to press flowers and maybe we can save it for a good character? I can't recall pressing flowers. Um, Mrs. Norris, I believe, was collecting rose petals probably to make, um, to use in her still room to make um, Oh, potpourris and um, essential oils for soaps. And at this time, women, we're still often in charge of the family still room, or if you were wealthy enough, you'd have a housekeeper. And so if you had an estate with flowers, you'd be, and herbs, you'd be gathering them and, and distilling them and um, making your own scents. Cities, obviously, you'd be buying something. Um, but she's, she's such a magpie, isn't she? She's a scavenger. So she, <laughs> look, we have rose petals and no one's using them and, and I may as well get them for free. Um, I honestly, can't think. I wouldn't be surprised. Of course, I'm sure Fanny Price pressed a flower in, in her books. Um, I will I will look that up. It did, nothing occurs to me immediately. Hmm. So. Um, we've had a question in the chat room from Jeffrey. He said, could you clarify the syringa issue? Why are some of the same, uh, why are flowers given some of the same names? Okay, yes. So I once spent about four days researching this. And so I'm pretty sure, I'm about 90% sure that I can go out on a limb and say that what Cooper was talking about in his poem that Jane Austen then talks about planting syringa and laburnum in her garden, um, that, that they meant mock orange, which we call it the, the name is actually is Philadelphus. But um, looking back and looking at a lot of what people were saying and the way they were, and of course the, the taxonomic terms are however you say it at the time, um, they've changed. A lot of things have changed since then. But it seems that they were commonly referring to Philadelphus mock orange as syringa. And this is a particular type of, some of them were coming from America. Uh, a lot of your plants, a lot of what we think of as English cottage garden plants are actually American. Um, and, and let me just say, I forget who said it, but someone said that American flowers went to England for an education. <laughs> so they were often then hybridized and we then we got them back as, as more tame garden, uh, garden plants. Um, so syringa now, when we say that, we mean lilac. But if you, the big clue that set me off was that Cooper's po uh, poem refers to it as syringa ivory pure. 
And so unless you have a white lilac, which is not the species lilac, um, that wouldn't make sense. Um, and laburnum is clear enough. Laburnum is the, the golden tree. Um, but, but it seems clear that it's mock orange. So, and I stand by that. <laughs> That's great detective work. Oh, this is the kind of thing I will spend. I once wrote a blog on um, General Tilney's, um, why Henry Tilney's housekeeper was in such a fright um, when General Tilney came to visit. And I spent, again, about three days determining what time sunset was that night in that area of England to see whether or not they were driving home, you know, with torches, uh, or, you know, with, with lights on the carriage. And so anyway, didn't go in the blog, but I now know. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> There's a whole separate one that you can do it on things that, you've yeah. Oh, yeah. things that you've discovered. Um, whilst I just wait there for another question, the question I was going to um, ask um, was, we obviously we've been looking at the history and a lot of work on the the history of Chorlton House and when things moved and we know the gardens particularly the wall gardens moved around um over the the kind of history of um of the property um, and we know obviously that Jane writes to um Jane writes and talks about Edward um is thinking of building a new garden um, and that's around when she is writing those really vivid descriptions of landscape in, in Mansfield Park. Now, I am not an expert, but I wonder from my kind of lay interpretation of it that she's seeing what her brother is considering and what her brother's doing it. And that's filtering um, into a kind of into how she's writing Mansfield Park, particularly. Um, is there a particular part of, of one of of Austin's novels where you think having visited Chawton House you think that's that's kind there's there's the ghost of Chawton House in that particular aspect of it. I think I see hints of of all the family properties in everything um and and the people you know I always think of John Thorpe and it must have been um her brother's you know university roommates that sort of thing um Mansfield Park was couple of years earlier than that letter, wasn't it? I can't quite recall. But the thing is, the, I'm sure these things were under discussion everywhere. Um, when they, the, from the moment they knew that, that Edward was going to be the heir to um, the estates, to the Knight estates, you know, and she began to visit those properties, well then naturally you see the discussions. And even when the Austins were still at Steventon, you know, they're already improving their property. Uh, turning that into something approaching you know, a, um, what was called a ferme orne, which is a, a ornamented farm. So you, you take your old fashioned farm, but since a gentleman lives there, um, you improve it. Uh, and then she knew, you know, uh, they were friends with all the gentry. So she's constantly hearing talk of the improvement of the estate. Uh, and this was um, just in the air at the time. It was a very popular subject for thought amongst the land owning classes. Uh, and in literature, um, and even you know plays, and obviously and things. Um, so I I think it's 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 just something she imbibed. But I do every time I see a very specific thing mentioned in in one of the books, I think that must come from her family experience, or at the very least, close friends. Um, and and everyone will say like Stoneley Abbey, oh the chapel there reminds us of the one at Southerton. Um, but I have wondered, it seems to me that, that often the manor houses are about the level of Chawton House, you know, and that's the life she knew best. Um, so I do think that must have, must have crept in in many places. No, I, I agree. And it's, well, it's the sort of place that, that um, even now, 200 and nearly 250 years on, that is, that's, prompts that kind of creativity and inspiration just because of the way you walk up and away from the house at the back um, in yeah. whatever configuration the gardens have been over a period of time but you can lose yourself in the gardens and lose yourself in in kind of thought and you can see that 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 surely must have as you said formed what she was really familiar with um, mm -hmm. and, and and made its way made its way into her works so i'm just going to check with chat make sure i've covered all of those questions yep good 
I don't want to miss anybody out. <laughs> there were um, some questions on the YouTube video, but I didn't I have a chance to look at those. I don't know if that was anything. Um, um, before we um, before we finish, you've considered tea and you've considered gardens. Do you have, um, is there something else that has been um, uh, kind of itching you to, to, to explore, explore anymore? Uh, just as soon as you said tea, I have got my, I've got my cup of tea right next to me. Oh, well done. <laughs> well, I have mine in my, well, my man, the gap, uh, <laughs> which this is, this is metaphorical for me. This is like in the morning, mind the gap, you know. Um, <laughs> The um, yes, I actually I will I will announce now. Um, I'm working on a, a book about parties. So um, and in fact, I'm going to be gathering. I've got a few people who have volunteered to beta test recipes. Um, so again, answering my own questions, I am so curious about all the different parties people gave um, and the levels and. Um, you know, something from as simple as having tea, like the Austins would have people to tea, uh, up to some grand party that Mr. Darcy gave, uh, or the wannabes like Mrs. Elton, I've presented at the Jasno, the AGMs um, on that. So I've been working on this about five years actually, but now I'm going to, now that we're all trapped, <laughs> going to get serious um, and um, finish the recipes. And then uh, then we're, when we're all freed up, we can we can have some parties, so. I'm trying to decide if I call it um, a party with Jane Austen or something like um, entertaining Mr. Darcy, which um, I think maybe would be kind of, that sounds intriguing to me, but I don't know. I'll take votes if anyone. I, I think entertaining Mr. Darcy might take you down all sorts of different um, graveled paths. <laughs> <laughs> and I always like a good entendre, double entendre if I can get one. So. <laughs> well, Discovery met with our collective approval. <laughs> I'm afraid and see, having announced it publicly, now I have to to really move on it. So um yes. Well, we're going to, um, to um end the Zoom chat, I'm afraid, because next up we have a creative writing workshop on Zoom. So I'll have to say thank you so so much, Kim, for speaking to us and for your exciting news as well. That's a, a scoop for us. <laughs> Well, thank you for inviting me. This was just delightful. I'm I'm really impressed with your creativity and and um, keeping the keeping the word going while while we're all at our houses. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye now.